Welcome to Urban Agriculture Field Experiences, Lesson 5 of the Intro to Urban Agriculture, Plant Growing Cycles, offered by the Lehigh County Conservation District with support from the National Association of Conservation Districts, the Ryder Pool Foundation, and the Harry C. Trexler Trust. If you think about our natural ecosystem carefully, it doesn't take long to realize that it is largely governed by cycles. How many eco-cycles can you think of? Some that may quickly come to mind include cycles of the season, the metamorphosis of a caterpillar into a butterfly, the cycle of a seed turning into a plant that produces more seeds, the migration pattern of any number of animal species, or the tidal cycles. There are many intricate cycles in our environment as well, the nitrogen cycle, respiration, transpiration, and the cycle of cell division. The list of sequences that allow for continual life on Earth goes on and on. Lesson 5 focuses on several important cycles necessary for plant growth, especially the water cycle and the cyclical movement of CO2 and O2 that occurs during photosynthesis and respiration. Finally, the importance of the light cycle for plant growth will also be addressed. Water is necessary for plants and all forms of life. Humans and most animals can live only days without it. 60% of our body and 73% of our brain is comprised of water. Many, though not all, plants require a consistent supply of water for photosynthesis, or the production of plant food in the form of glucose, and respiration, the conversion of the glucose so that the energy can be used by the varying types of plant cells. Additionally, the rigidity of plant stems, leaves, roots, and petals is all a function of requiring the movement of water through the plant. Some may wonder exactly how water moves through a plant. Let's start by understanding that water, or H2O, is made of two positively charged hydrogen atoms and one negatively charged oxygen atom. Water molecules stick together in strong bonds because the two small positive hydrogen atoms are very attracted to the large negatively charged oxygen atom. Cohesion is a water molecule's attractivity to another water molecule because of its bipolar nature. The water movement occurring because of cohesion is how water begins traveling up xylem plant tissue, or capillary tubes that transport water. Adhesion is when water is attractive to other substances. When water is spilled on a counter, the puddle of water molecules stick together because of cohesion. If a paper towel is introduced, the water molecules will begin traveling throughout the towel and this is adhesion. Adhesion is what allows many water molecules to be pulled at once through plant xylem tubes, against the force of gravity, into the upper limits of the tree or plant. To water or not to water, that is the question. When germinating seeds, water is a major requirement. The soil where the seeds are planted should be checked daily for moisture content. When plants begin to grow, the soil they are planted in will continually need to be monitored for water content. Watering a plant too frequently might cause the roots to rot because too much water will not allow the air required by the plant to reach the roots. Conversely, not watering a plant enough will cause it to wilt and die because there is no mechanism for the necessary nutrients to move through the plant. A rule of thumb for watering plants is to use your thumb or finger. If soil sticks to your finger when inserted in about an inch of soil, then hold off on watering. If the soil is dry at this level, then go ahead and water the plant until water drains through the bottom of the container. Young seedlings should be watered with a spray bottle, and even young plants need to be watered gently at the base of their stems. This is because they are not strong enough to withstand the strong force of water coming from a watering can. Older, stronger plants can be watered overhead with watering cans, though watering from the base of a plant is more efficient and can even conserve water. Another plant requirement besides soil, air, and water is light. The light produced by the sun that we are able to see is called the visible light spectrum. We can see various wavelengths of this spectrum in a rainbow, or when light beam is split by a prism. Remember the mnemonic. Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. There are various wavelengths of this visible light spectrum that are required for healthy plant growth. Red wavelengths provide light energy that helps a plant develop flowers and fruit. Blue wavelengths, however, provide light energy responsible for vegetative plant growth. The various functions of growing plants, such as vegetative growth and fruit and bloom production, occur when a plant photosynthesizes. This is the process used by a plant to change light energy from the sun into chemical energy for the plant. This reaction utilizes sunlight to convert water and carbon dioxide taken in by the plant into glucose or sugar, water, and oxygen. The formula outlined for photosynthesis is 6H2O plus 6CO2 plus energy from the sunlight yields C6H12O6 plus 6O2. C6H12O6 is the chemical formula for glucose and this is further broken down by plants during respiration into other forms of energy that different types of plant cells can utilize. Some common grow lights that can be used indoors to provide plants with the light they need for photosynthesis include incandescent lights, fluorescent lights, and LED lights. Incandescent lights, though inexpensive, require the most energy and give a lot of heat and therefore must be placed at least two feet above the plants. Fluorescent lights are more expensive yet more efficient with less heat output. These are often used to germinate seeds inside. Have you ever wondered why LED grow lights sometimes contain small blue, red, and white lights? The blue lights can be turned on to encourage photosynthesis which then spurs on vegetative growth. The red lights, for fruit and bloom growth, and the white lights can provide warmth and heat. 
Both fluorescent and LED lights can be placed closer to plants, between 6 and 12 inches because they do not give off as much heat. Also remember to adjust the height of the lights as plants grow. All plants need a break from photosynthesis at night when it's dark, but there is yet another process that takes place in plants throughout the day and night called respiration. Respiration is the process where plants take in oxygen to break down glucose produced during photosynthesis into usable energy, water, and yes, carbon dioxide. The equation for respiration is exactly opposite of photosynthesis. C6H12O6 plus 6O2 yields 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus 32 ATP, or usable energy. Though plants do produce some carbon dioxide during respiration, it is only half of the carbon dioxide they require to photosynthesize which is why plants remain a carbon sink and are considered a valuable asset in helping to reduce Earth's carbon footprint. When indoor plants are being grown under lights, it is important to remember to put the grow lights on a timer. All plants need to have a dark period in an outdoor setting, during which they receive a break from photosynthesis. As a general guide, it is best to give plants between 16 and 18 hours of light and between 6 and 8 hours of dark. The suggestions provided are general guidelines, because every plant has its own specific needs for germination and requirements for light, heat, and water, Students should always do a little research to ensure their plants are getting the adequate requirements. During the last centuries, many of the cycles in nature have changed or become interrupted in various ways. Developments and practices resulting from the Industrial Revolution throughout the 20th century have resulted in environmental impacts such as climate change. Some of these impacts do not allow Earth to regenerate quickly or for the natural cycles to function accurately. Studying and understanding some of our environment's basic cycles can lead to greater understandings of how Earth has been able to thrive, efficiently regenerate, and evolve over time. In the environmental field, we are realizing that there is no point in sustaining a broken system. Understanding cycles and restoring broken cycles will lead us to a point of sustainability and the career opportunities involved in reaching this goal are endless. Lesson PowerPoint Review Lesson 5 Plant Growing Cycles What is water? A molecule of water, also known as H2O, consists of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Aside from water's liquid form, it can be found in its solid form, ice, and its gaseous state, water vapor. At room temperature, water is a liquid with no smell or taste and can dissolve and transport many substances. Scientists believe that Earth's atmosphere, which is largely comprised of water vapor in the form of clouds, was derived when gaseous stars containing water vapor collided with one another to form the Earth. Comets, also containing ice, collided with the Earth around this time, contributing to the origin of water on Earth. The water cycle is the circulation of water from Earth's atmosphere, to Earth, and back up to the atmosphere again. It is driven by the heat of the sun. Precipitation from the clouds, in the form of snow, sleet, or rain, falls to the Earth where it may percolate underground or into an ocean, lake, river, or other body of water. Through evapotranspiration, ice, snow, and liquid water will convert into water vapor and become a part of the atmosphere again through this continuous cycle. Transpiration is water's movement through plants and its evaporation from plant parts into the atmosphere. Water moves through plants via capillary action a process that involves cohesion and adhesion. The bipolar nature of water makes individual water molecules pull or stick together. These groups of water molecules can move up the xylem capillaries in plants through adhesive properties of the plant that attract the water molecules upward. Together, these attraction properties allow water to defy gravity and move upward through capillary action. If food coloring or dye is added to a plant watering supply, capillary action can be observed as the plant dye travels up the plant stem and out to the petals where it is ultimately deposited. Students may use their insights about how capillary action works in a plant to design weekend watering systems for plants out of common materials, such as recycled water bottles. Visible light is the rainbow of light we are able to observe when a sunlight beam is refracted by water or a prism, in the form of a rainbow. The colors red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet are useful in helping a plant to produce vegetation, fruit, and to grow in an overall healthy way. Photosynthesis is the daytime process used by a plant to change light energy from the sun into chemical energy for the plant. This reaction utilizes sunlight to convert water and carbon dioxide taken in by a plant into glucose, water, and oxygen. The formula outlined for photosynthesis is 6H2O plus 6CO2 plus energy from the sunlight yields C6H12O6 plus 6O2. C6H12O6 is the formula for glucose. This is further broken down by a plant during respiration into other forms of energy utilization for differing types of plant cells. Respiration is an ongoing process in plants whereby oxygen is taken in and used to convert glucose produced during photosynthesis into energy that varying types of plant cells can use to perform their specific functions of growth and repair. Respiration yields CO2, heat energy, and H2O byproducts. Respiration's formula is the opposite of photosynthesis. C6H12O6 plus 6O2 yields 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus 32 ATP, or usable energy. 
Grow lights are lights used in indoor settings that emit visible light needed for plant growth. During the week of this course, educators can use the vocabulary list and activities provided in Lesson Plan 5, Plant Growing Cycles, to give students background about the basics of plant light and water requirements. Using water dyed with food coloring, students can observe the passage of water from one area to another through capillary action, which involves adhesion and cohesion of water molecules. An extension that allows students to witness capillary action in plants involves using the dyed water to color flowers. Students will spend the rest of their time contemplating the water and light needs of their seedlings. This involves challenging students to design a watering system that keeps plants hydrated over the holidays and weekends, and another activity during which students can install pulley systems to allow for grow light height adjustments. Finally, the physical byproduct of water, produced during plant respiration, is witnessed when students grow their own basil plants. Hi, my name is Jolie Shilak. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the Lehigh County Conservation District and I are so happy to be bringing this urban ag curriculum to you. Uh, right now we're working on Unit 5, Lesson 5, and that's on plant growing cycles. And so the project today is going to be growing a plant in a mug and actually being able to see some of the byproducts of photosynthesis and, and respiration. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about what photosynthesis actually is. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of fun thing to introduce to the kids because it's all about sugar. Um, the chemical formula for photosynthesis is six molecules of water and six molecules of carbon dioxide in the presence of light allows a plant to make sugar, C6H12O6, and six molecules of oxygen. So today, a lot of students know how important plants are in producing oxygen for us, but they might not understand also that the plant is producing energy for itself, almost making food for itself, and that is in the form of the sugar that we were just talking about. So often what I like to do is bring in a lot of different types of sugar. Um, maple syrup is a good one. Uh, cane sugar and the little sugar packs works too. And we talk about how every single plant is actually producing sugar when it's going through photosynthesis. The other part of uh, the other reaction that a plant is going through is respiration. Respiration doesn't actually require the sunlight and it's going on all the time as well, but it's something that a lot of people associate with what a plant does at nighttime when the sun is away. But a plant is actually respiring all the time as well and it's actually the inverse of photosynthesis. And so it's the plant is taking the sugar, C6H12O6, plus um, the oxygen molecules so plant actually does take in oxygen as well, and then it converts it into um, molecules of carbon dioxide and some molecules of, um, of water, and then also some ATP, which is usable energy. And so why a plant is respiring is it's taking that sugar that was made in photosynthesis that's really great and it's making it into other types of sugars that can be used by different types of plant cells. So it's a very important process. Um, it does yield a little bit of carbon dioxide, um, but it, it, it's not as much um, carbon dioxide as what is taken in through photosynthesis. And so that is why trees remain a very important part of our um, natural system for absorbing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere because plants and, and trees are net sinks for carbon dioxide. Okay, so how can we kind of see a little bit of what's going on in these reactions? Well, that's kind of something that we can do in pretty, pretty easily in the classroom. Um, Sometimes I think it's fun just to show kids that they can grow in, in all sorts of things. And even a mug, which doesn't have any holes in the bottom, you can get a nice herb garden growing in several mugs if you wanted by just putting some rocks in the bottom of the of the um, mug. And I didn't go over the things that you'd need for this. Uh, you would need a mug. You need some rocks, you need some soil, um, of course some seeds, and then a bag which is going to sort of act like the greenhouse for this project, 
a rubber band to keep the bag in place so that no oxygen gets in and we can actually see what's going on in the closed system. And then the Sharpie marker here is just for marking your uh, mug, making sure that the kids have their names on so that they know which one is theirs and can keep track of when they planted it. You can put a date on. So back to what I was starting out to do. We're going to take this um, mug, fill it with about a half an inch of rocks, and that's going to be for the drainage. When the basil plant is, uh, seeds are placed in there and they start growing their roots, um, if we don't have a place for the, the water that we put into, water the plant to drain into, then the roots are going to get wet and um, they might rot. So that's why we put the stones in when we don't have a natural drain in our container. The next thing to do is to take your soil and we're going to fill, fill our, I'm actually not going to use the trowel for this because I want to and your students might want to wear gloves. I always encourage them not to be afraid of getting dirty, but, um, but sometimes if you think it's going to deter them from the activity, just supply them with the gloves because it's a lot more fun to have people interested in doing it because they're comfortable about what's on their hands. Okay, so you fill the mug up to about maybe a quarter inch from the top. And then I always tell the students just to make a slight hole about a quarter of an inch in. And today we're gonna plant basil. Um, you could plant all sorts of things um, in here, but uh, basil is a really hardy plant. It grows fairly easily in the lab, and so usually there's good success. So what we'll do is we'll make sure that we have maybe three or four seeds of basil and that's that's always tough for the kids because they see that basil seeds are so little and you think you need a lot but only three or four seeds um, you don't want to make the hole too deep because um, the seeds will germinate um, when the water hits them but then they need to get out of the soil so we'll only make a shallow hole cover that hole back up and then of course we're going to add the water And then the next thing that the students can do so that they can see the water that is a product of the respiration that we were talking about. You know, obviously we've got, we've got uh, the water that we've used to water the plant, but it's now down in the soil. And over time, um, that that water is going to evaporate out. And if when we get our large basil plant, it's going to do something called transpiration. And that's where it releases the water that it produces through the um, little, sorry, should do this over. It releases the water through stomata, which are the holes on the underside of the leaves. And that water goes back up into the atmosphere and turns into a cloud and comes back down to our ground in the form of rain or snow or sleet. There we go. So now it's just a little tricky to get the rubber band <laughs> around. One more time. Okay. Put this on here. And it will only take about a night for the students to see. The plant won't even be growing. They'll start to see the evapotranspiration going on. Um, but you can continue this project uh, when, when the plant is growing and see that the plant is respiring and going through transpiration. All right, there we go. OK. so. Then the next thing would be to label it, the date, um, when it was planted. And then the students can also see how long it takes for a basil seed to germinate. And eventually the transpiration will happen. And um, you can talk about it being that, that very important respiration reaction. 
When the basil is a little bit bigger, maybe two or three inches high, you can take this um, greenhouse bag off and just keep growing it. And eventually there will be nice leaves and those leaves can be used for bruschetta. Um, our nutritionist comes in and makes that with tomatoes um, on some toast. Sometimes we make an infused water that has strawberries and basil and lemon in it. Um, you can put basil with butter and make an herb butter and then have that on toast. Um, or some caprice salad with mozzarella and Italian dressing and basil is really good too. So I hope you'll not only learn a little science from doing this project with your students, but then also enjoy eating the rewards. Thanks so much for joining us. There are several thought-provoking opportunities to extend the fifth lesson, plant growing cycles. When growing areas are set up in an indoor classroom, there are lots of ways that seedlings can be started. Trays of grow pellets may be purchased in garden and hardware stores to begin propagating plants for spring planting in the outdoor beds. It's also fun to brainstorm and devise seedling starting containers that can be made from recycled materials such as strips of newspaper, toilet or paper towel rolls, or even plastic yogurt or curate coffee pod containers. How much money can be saved for using materials from around the home or school to start seeds? How creative can students be? Grow tents with mirrored insides are nice ways to increase lighting, control heat, and improve aeration. However, these tents can be expensive. Students can brainstorm grow tent models of their own, also using recycled materials such as cardboard boxes, used but clean plastic bags, sheets of styrofoam, and other materials. Typically, plants grow best at temperatures between 60 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Using a thermometer, have your students devise their own system that keeps temperatures in this range. Also try having your students develop adequate watering methods that can be incorporated into this system. As mentioned throughout this lesson, 70% of the world's fresh water supply is used in agriculture. Try visiting a local water authority with your students to see just how involved it is to clean our water. Brainstorm measures that might lessen our impact on the world's fresh water supply. We hope you enjoyed our quick lesson on the Intro to Urban Agriculture Plant Growing Cycles. For more information on the Urban Agriculture Field Experiences lesson plan, visit www.lehighconservation.org or follow us on our Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube pages. Thanks for watching, and be sure to check out the rest of the videos in the Urban Agriculture Lesson Plan series.